So, hi all, my name is Zach Ford. Um, I'm a senior program manager here at Age United where I oversee our harm reduction portfolio. Um, so I, I oversee our capacity building, technical assistance, um, and grant making as it relates to harm reduction, syringe access, and syringe services pronouns, uh, syringe services programs. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, um, and I'm going to pass it over to Drew, uh, my colleague, to introduce himself. Thanks, Zach. Uh, my name is Drew Gibson. I am the policy manager for HIV and drug user health at AIDS United. My pronouns are he, him. Um, and I guess in my, in my role here, I uh, cover everything related to harm reduction and certain service programs uh, for AIDS United's policy department, in addition to dealing with um, drug user health appropriations asks um, and helping folks out with TA at the state and local level. Um, I also run the Coalition for Surge Access. Um, and I'll, I'll provide a link to that in the uh, description uh, to our website and our Twitter feed. But if you want to become a member of Coalition for Students Access, just ask. Um, our meetings are open to everyone. Thanks, Joe. Um, so thanks everyone so much for joining us this, uh, well, it's evening for me. Um, and uh, we're going to go through some, just like some very kind of basics of harm reduction pretty quickly, talk about some of the, um, the challenges uh, that we're seeing currently, talk about a few of the barriers, um, especially barriers at the federal level in terms of federal policy. Um, and Drew's gonna walk us through some of, some of those barriers, how we can incorporate advocacy around syringe services and harm reduction into some of our visits tomorrow and take that back to some of the advocacy you might be doing at the local or state level. Um, and then we really wanna provide opportunity for some conversation, for some um, strategizing and allow folks to ask questions, of course, if you haven't. Um, so the, the presentation is going to kind of go back and forth between me and Drew. Um, I do encourage folks, like if, um, you know, if you have questions, if you want to jump in at any time, like, please, please feel free. Um, and with that, we can jump in and get started. Um, so I thought, uh, well, Drew and I thought it might be good just to kind of ground everyone so that we're all kind of on the same page about what we're talking about. I'm sure this information is familiar to a lot of y'all. Um, so when we talk about harm reduction, I like to kind of talk about um, the two different types of harm reduction. Um, so there's there's harm reduction as a movement uh, for social justice that's built on a belief in and a respect for the rights of people who use drugs. And then there's harm reduction uh, that's a set of practical strategies and ideas that seek to reduce the harms associated with both drug use and ineffective racialized drug policies. Um, we like to distinguish these, um, you know, some folks, as you see here, uh, harm reduction with a big H and a big R and then harm reduction with a little H and a little R. But Harm reduction refers to policies, programs, and practices that aim to minimize negative health, social, and legal impacts associated with drug use, drug policies, and drug laws. And harm reduction is grounded in justice and human rights. It focuses on positive change and on working with people without judgment or coercion or discrimination. Um, sorry, I, did I just put my notes in front of y'all? Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's late in the day over here for me, y'all. Um, so, uh, yeah, where was I? So harm reduction encompasses a range of health and social services and practices that applies to illicit and licit drugs. Um, and these include, but they're certainly not limited to things like drug consumption rooms, uh, safer consumption rooms, overdose prevention sites, um, syringe services, non-abstinence-based housing and employment initiatives, drug checking, overdose prevention reversal, psychosocial support, and the provision of information on safer drug use. So harm reduction incorporates a spectrum of strategies. That spectrum includes safer use, managed use, and also includes abstinence um, to meet people who use drugs where they're at and really addressing those conditions of use along with the use itself. Um, so for all people, harm reduction is really a daily practice. Uh, things like wearing a seatbelt, wearing a mask when you go outside, um, choosing not to drink and drive, wearing a condom, getting a flu shot, getting your COVID vaccine when you're eligible. These are all forms of harm reduction. Um, 
so there's some principles of harm reduction as well. And there's several different versions of these that exist. Um, and I, you know, some are really extensive, some are really long, some are pretty concise. Uh, my favorite version actually comes from Harm Reduction International. And they, I like it because they break it down into these four really easy to understand and digest categories. So you have respecting the rights of people who use drugs, a commitment to evidence, a commitment to social justice and collaborating with networks of people who use drugs, and the avoidance of stigma. So harm reduction is fundamentally grounded in principles that aim to protect human rights and improve public health. So treating people who use drugs along with their families and communities with compassion and dignity is integral to harm reduction. And the use of drugs does not mean people forfeit their human rights. So they remain entitled to the right to life and to the highest attainable standard of health. They remain entitled to the right to social services and to privacy and to freedom from arbitrary detention and to freedom from cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment, among other things. Harm reduction policies and practices are informed by a strong body of evidence that shows interventions to be practical, feasible, effective, safe, and cost-effective in diverse social, cultural, and economic settings. Um, most interventions are easy to implement. They're inexpensive. They all have strong positive impact on individual and community health. And in a little bit, we'll get into some of that um, research that I mentioned. Um, but harm reduction is also rooted in a commitment to addressing discrimination and ensuring that nobody is excluded from the health and social services they may need because of their drug use, their race, their gender, their gender identity, their sexual orientation, their choice of work, or their economic status. So people should be able to access services without having to overcome unnecessary barriers, including burdensome discriminatory regulations. And then further, the meaningful involvement of people who use drugs in designing implementing and evaluating programs and policies that serve them is central to harm reduction. And harm reduction practitioners accept people who use drugs as they are and are committed to meeting them where they are in their lives without judgment. Terminology and language should always convey respect and we avoid stigmatizing terms or divisions between good and bad drugs and stigmatizing language really perpetuates harmful stereotypes and creates barriers to health as well as to social services. Um, so there's a few other approaches outside of harm reduction that um, a lot of folks uh, might be more familiar with, um, not necessarily folks on this call. Um, and these are the two approaches that the United States has historically used to address substance use in the country. Um, so we have here um, supply reduction and demand reduction. So demand reduction, um, this approach locates the problem within a person and not with the substance. And so it finds a solution in reducing demand for the drugs themselves. And this is where we see things like the just say no campaign. Um, blame and moral judgment have been a traditional approach to discouraging and punishing people who use drugs. Um, along with demand reduction, we often see supply reduction. So this approach locates the problem within the substance and not the person. So this approach sensationalized stories of a drug's addictive properties um, that are really amplified and drug task forces, um, you know, might be called into safe communities. We see things like the war on drugs. We see things like racialized drug policies and mandatory minimums, um, all stemming from the supply reduction approach. And Drew, I think you're up. Thanks, Zach. So I know y'all don't need a, need a slide uh, to know this, but these approaches are not working. Uh, they haven't been working for the past 50 years. And the COVID-19 pandemic has really taken everything that was going wrong with the war on drugs um, and amplified it. Um, we have seen over the last uh, little over a year um, the mental health of Americans has gone down due to the isolation and stress um, accompanying the pandemic and the lives lost, family members, um, long-term COVID sickness, um, all leading to higher rates of uh, drug use and alcohol consumption. Um, you see there on the, the graph that there's been a 30% increase in anxiety and depression symptoms, 26 in trauma-related symptoms, and then about 
13 and 11 percent for uh, increased substance use or for uh, suicide. As a result, we've seen the highest number of drug overdose deaths over the past 12 months, uh, or at least from May of uh, 2019 to May of 2020, which comes as the start of COVID-19, than we ever had in the past with 81,000 people dying um, from overdose in this country. Um, one thing that's worth noting is that the war on drugs that Zachary, good Lord, I call him Zachary, that Zach spoke of, it's, it's, it's on your, your profile, um, that Zach talked about earlier, uh, really is directly attributable to many of these deaths. Uh, we're seeing the rise in synthetic opiates uh, like fentanyl um, as being responsible for a number of overdose deaths, but these aren't happening um, in opioids. We are seeing a really marked increase in the presence of fentanyl in amphetamines, um, in things that are being passed off as benzodiazepines, um, and in cocaine. Um, so people are overdosing on a drug that they don't even know that they're taking. Um, and this is all a direct response from the fact that the federal government in the United States and state and local governments um, have really prevented people to use drugs from a safe supply and prevented people to use drugs um, from really having access to means to know what's in the drugs that they're taking. Um, and this has been exacerbated by the COVID pandemic in large part because so many of the um, ways in which we address overdose risk um, involve other people. Uh, we encourage folks to carry naloxone, uh, to use in groups so that they can be safe, so that someone can call for paramedics or administer naloxone themselves if they're there. Uh, with COVID, all of our recommendations have been for people to be by themselves to avoid transmitting the virus. Um, and as a result, it's, it's fairly safe to assume that this has caused uh, some of the rise in overdose deaths. Um, next slide. Another thing that we probably don't need a slide to cover or let y'all know about, but um, which is the, the main story of the war on drugs is that it is an inherently racist war. Um, it has from the very beginning been uh, used to uh, marginalize and prosecute uh, black and brown Americans uh, from its inception in the Nixon administration all the way through to today. Um, we see this um, in the fact that at the end of 2018, um, the uh, highest rates of overdose deaths, uh, in incre highest increased in rates of overdose deaths were among black men. Um, nearly half of the people who are living with HIV and who inject drugs are black. Um, and among folks that are um, incarcerated in this country, uh, nearly 80% of the people in federal prison and almost 60% of people in state prison for drug offenses are either black or Latinx. Um, research shows that prosecutors are twice as likely to uh, pursue mandatory minimum sentence for uh, black people as they are for white people charged with the exact same offense. Um, and uh, people of color have experienced discrimination at every stage of the criminal legal system. Uh, they're more likely to be stopped, searched, arrested, convicted, and harshly sentenced and settled with a lifelong criminal record uh, due to their race or ethnicity. Um, Rudy Giuliani made an entire political career on this. Um, the war on drugs is inherently racist and uh, any opposition to that must take, um, you know, the decades of institutional oppression of uh, black, brown, and indigenous Americans uh, into account. Uh, next slide. So, good. I actually did not see the Charlie Brown sigh before I actually sighed. Uh, so that was genuine. Um, that thanks peanuts. Um, even with COVID happening, there are still so many restrictions on uh, ways in which people who use drugs can get access to the treatment uh, and healthcare that they need and deserve. Um, we saw earlier in the COVID pandemic that some of the telehealth. Um, restrictions on medication assisted treatment uh, for buprenorphine were lifted, which is wonderful. Um, folks shouldn't have to be going into uh, their doctor's office every time they need to refill a prescription of buprenorphine. Um, but that is only a small part of a much wider problem. We were still hearing from advocates all across the country, uh, people who use drugs who were having to stand in line indoors to receive their daily methadone doses or take-home doses in the middle of a pandemic that is spread 
um, through the air. Like the, the, the idea that we would be putting uh, the lives of people who use drugs at risk because of some arcane and outmoded way of distributing uh, medications to treatment is just wrong. It's not best practice. Um, and we need to stop it and we need to make sure that um, things like buprenorphine are available to as many folks as possible and that more doctors, physicians, uh, nurses, uh, pharmacists can prescribe it um, easily. That is why one of the key asks um, that we will be having in our meetings tomorrow, if you're attending them, is to support the MAD Act, which is the Mainstream Addiction Treatment Act. Uh, it is sponsored by Representative Paul Tonko of New York, has great bipartisan support, and basically it will get rid of the buprenorphine X waiver, uh, which mandates that uh, any physician or uh, nurse who prescribes buprenorphine or wants to has to go to an eight hour training course uh, before they're allowed to do so, which is kind of weird uh, because there's no eight hour mandatory training course for prescribing opioids. Um, and it's very hypocritical and very harmful um, uh, to, to mandate that folks, you know, take eight hours of extra training to prescribe a treatment to something that they don't have to have that same training to prescribe in the first place. Um, the last name of the representative who supports the MAT Act is Representative Paul Tonko, T-O-N-K-O, -O, kind of like the truck, but with an O at the end. Um, but uh, this is also not to say that opioids, prescription opioids are the problem. Uh, we certainly uh, want to note that chronic pain patients and folks who need opioids to you know, make sure that their standard of living is, is, is good and that they're ma managing their pain well have been really unfairly marginalized. Uh, we've swung the other ways in society to the point where um, many doctors are terrified to prescribe opioids for fear of censure from administration or government officials. Um, and people that are in pain are not getting the care that they need. So just to say that the, the purpose in um, sort of removing the X waiver is not to say, hey, you know, folks are, are prescribing opioids too willy nilly. It's the opposite of that. It's, it's we need to make sure that doctors and nurses are empowered to work with their patients to ensure that they get the, pair, that get the care they need without government interference. Um, two other things, uh, there are still 13 states that prohibit syringe distribution. Um, we're currently dealing with a, an issue in West Virginia right now involving a state um, that still has syringe uh, legal syringe distribution, but is facing increasing political pressure to remove it. Uh, it's certainly not unique to West Virginia. There are more conservative areas of the country that um, have seen a lot of NIMBY pushback, uh, NIMBY being not in my backyard, folks, um, to SSPs. And it's really our duty as advocates and harm reductionists to ensure that um, the backlash doesn't win, uh, that best practices uh, continue to be enforced and that those areas of the country that don't have them uh, do and quickly. Uh, and the final one is the federal funding ban on syringe services programs. Uh, for the past, I believe I wanna say seven years, maybe eight years, um, the federal government has had at least a full or partial um, ban on funding for SSPs. Um, about four or five years ago, it was changed so that only uh, syringes and injection related equipment um, can no longer be purchased with federal funds. Um, but it's still an absurd law. Uh, we've already gotten rid of it once um, during Obama's first term. Uh, we're looking to get rid of it again. Um, there's tremendous bipartisan support. It's just one of those things that um, once something's, you know, in place, it's hard to get it unstuck. So we're hopeful that we'll um, get it through the appropriations process this time around. Um, and we'll, we'll need your help to do that in the meetings tomorrow. Next slide. Uh, thanks, Drew. So, um, you know, we talked about um, some of the other approaches to substance use that um, have been more commonly used in the United States. And I, I wanted to kind of um, highlight those to to help folks understand harm reduction as it contrasts to those approaches. Um, harm reduction really um, rather than locating a problem within the drugs themselves or within the people themselves, it really sees the issue of um, being in the relationship between the two um, and recognizes that criminalizing the drugs 
isn't going to help and that criminalizing the people isn't going to help. So harm reduction really focuses on positive change um, and on working with people without judgment, without coercion, discrimination, or requiring that they stop using drugs as a precondition of support. Um, Harm reduction is policies, programs, and practices that aim to minimize negative health, social, and legal impacts associated with drug use and with drug laws. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, harm reduction is really based in science. Um, so, you know, it's one of the most effective harm reduction inter interventions that we have. Um, and, or sorry, one of the most effective harm reduction interventions we have is syringe services programs. Um, and these are, we commonly call them SSPs. Um, so they're associated with an estimated 50% reduction in HIV and hepatitis C rates. Um, a 2018 study by the Yale School of Public Health found that the HIV outbreak in Scott County, Indiana back in 2015 could have been avoided with comprehensive syringe services. Services. So when the outbreak occurred, syringe services were illegal in the state of Indiana, and researchers found that earlier action could have brought the actual number of infections from around 215 down to only 10. Um, and we know that SSPs also go beyond um, just addressing the need for sterile injection supplies. Uh, they provide a broad range of linkage and support services for participants who have been pushed out or left out of more traditional healthcare services. And another point about syringe services programs is that they are really cost effective. Um, the impact of an expansion of syringe services programs in New York City was studied from 1990 to 2002. And during that time frame, syringe distribution in New York City increased significantly, going from around 250,000 a year to over 3 million syringes a year. And researchers found that HIV prevalence declined among people who use drugs from 50% to 17%. Um, and an evaluation of uh, the impact of syringe services legalization in the District of Columbia showed a 70% decrease in new HIV cases among people who inject drugs and a total of 120 HIV cases averted in two years because of syringe services programs. And then there was a cost effectiveness analysis um, that estimated that a $10 million annual investment by the US government and syringe services programs would result in 194 HIV infections averted in one year and a lifetime treatment cost savings of $75.8 million, showing a return on investment of $7.58 for every $1 that the US government spent. Um, and then lastly, um, the, the graphs and charts that you see on the screen, this is from a 2019 study that was done in Philadelphia and also in Baltimore that demonstrated that syringe services programs prevented a total of 12,483 new cases of HIV over a 10 year period. So the science is really on our side that really, I mean, completely supports and proves that syringe services programs work at reducing rates of infectious disease among people who use drugs. Um, and so there's absolutely no reason for the US government to be banning funds to support uh, the purchase of syringes to support syringe services programs. Um, and of course, if any anyone is interested in some of these studies, wants links to anything to help um, as they prepare for meetings tomorrow, um, I'm happy to share those things. Um, just send me a message in the chat um, with your email and I can send some, um, some links and stuff. All right, thanks, Zach. Um, so full disclosure, I did the thing where I talked about the slide before the slide happened. Um, so we've already covered the uh, need to fully repeal the federal ban on, on funding for student services programs. I did have someone ask when they would bring that up in a conversation um, on the Hill. Whenever you're talking about funding, right? Um, just sort of bring it up and mention it in a very practical way um, in that, you know, it, it's, it's patently absurd that they're giving funding for a program but not a specific pro part of the program and the specific part that's most integral to the program. Like the, the idea that they're not funding syringes for syringes services programs is kind of bizarre. Um, so generally if you're making funding asks um, along with the AIDS budget and appropriation coalition chart um, numbers that we provide in the AIDS watch briefs, 
uh, that would be the time to do it. Um, speaking of investing in uh, funding for harm reduction, uh, the big ask we're making this year is for $120 million for fiscal year 2022 um, in the CDC's opioid related infectious diseases programs. Um, the reason we're doing this is that historically there has not really been any dedicated federal funding specifically for harm reduction. Um, you'll see announcements for these big like multi-billion dollar grants coming out of uh, the uh, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, SAMHSA, um, or, or out of the CDC or elsewhere, and you'll think, oh my God, they're giving so much money to, to, to harm reduction, and they're not. Um, they're giving money to more traditional treatment services um, and healthcare providers, and generally harm reduction um, providers and SSPs, which are smaller, uh, most often sort of get left out in the dust. So what we're trying to do is create a dedicated stream of funding um, that goes directly to harm reduction. That's kind of the, that's the gold mine in federal advocacy. It's right why HIV has been able to be so robustly funded for uh, decades now, because Ryan White exists. And because year over year over year, if Congress wants to take away money, they have to explicitly do that from last year's funding. There's a set stream every year that goes to HIV. Um, and it would be great to have that for harm reduction and for um, SSPs. Uh, there's a piece of legislation um, that hopefully will be uh, reintroduced later this year uh, by Senator Elizabeth Warren. Um, and uh, now it'll be Representative Karen Maloney. It was co-sponsored by the, the late Elijah Cummings uh, called the CARES Act that would essentially create a Ryan White Care Act like structure specifically for um, the overdose epidemic and uh, with specific carve outs for harm reduction. Uh, so that funding ask is a thing that I, I hope that folks really push for um, on your meetings tomorrow, um, as well as the Mainstream Addiction Treatment Act that we talked about earlier on the buprenorphine waiver, the X waiver. Um, that, that's all I have there. Um, I don't know if that was the last slide or if we have one more. Um, that's the last one. Um, something I, I'm going to stop sharing so we, um, do, do, I can see the chat. Um, but something I do like to tell folks, especially when we're, um, you know, because I get the question sometimes like, um, like your Age United, your mission is to end the HIV epidemic. Why? Why do you invest in syringe services programs? Why are you um, supporting harm reduction? Like what's the angle here? And the, um, the reality is that 10% of new HIV cases in the United States are attributed to injection drug use. Um, and so something that I'm always telling folks is that if, if our mission as Age United is to end the HIV epidemic in the United States, that means we have to end it for everyone. Um, and that includes people who use drugs. And so, um, you know, when we're talking to, to policymakers, it's really important to make sure that they understand the connection between drug use and harm reduction and HIV advocacy and funding and recognizing that the um, the funding that goes to support harm reduction and syringe services programs is funding that will help reduce HIV cases in the U.S. and also connect people um, who are living with HIV to the treatment and the care that they need. Um, and so that that kind of bridge there is really critical, I think, in making some of the policy asks that you'll um, or that you'll be you'll discussing tomorrow. Um, do folks have, I haven't been able to see the chat, so I'm getting caught up. Um, so I don't know um, if there have been any questions that have come in. And and feel free to, to raise a hand or unmute, or I, I don't know the best way to do this um, right now, but because has a digital hand raise. Hi, am I good to go? You're good to go. Um, I just wanted to mention that um, in West Virginia, in Conwell County, they they stopped their syringe access program and they, they saw an immediate spike in HIV cases. And also I'm with Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center here in Honolulu, Hawaii. Hawaii has had a publicly funded syringe exchange program for about 30 years now. And the track, and we exchanged 1.18 million syringes last year, statewide, including the the main, 
the most populated island of Oahu, in addition to Kauai, Maui, and Hawaii Island. And what we've seen is that we've been a, uh, a low incident state for that, for that period of time. And um, we have a great, uh, we have a great track record here. And I, I hope that I'll be able to encourage our congressional delegation uh, tomorrow to, to really forward the success of the Hawaii experience uh, over decades and that funding for syringe services program, including syringes, um, is a very wise, judicious, and also a very humane investment. That's all. Thanks so much for that, Nikos. Um, it, it, it's really been um, great to see sort of the, the investment that we're getting from um, our, our, our partners in Hawaii, both with the Coalition for Syringe Access. I know HEP Free Hawaii has worked with us in the past. Um, and, and the number of folks who show up for AIDS Watch every year um, between Kivale and, um, and others, it's, it's just, it's wonderful to see. Um, and we would love to be able to use y'all as a, um, a, a positive story um, when talking about the legislators. Um, so, you know, if you ever have any materials that you want to uh, pass on to us that we can highlight, we'd be more than happy to do so. Yeah, we, we also issue an annual report um, every year. There's usually a bit of a lag time because it has to go through, through an epidem epidemiologist and other uh, review mechanisms, but um, that's, that's available online. I'll, I'll find the link and I, I'll put it in the chat box right now. Thank you. See, Russell is next. Hi, that's me. Um, so I appreciate you guys doing this. This is a big deal for me to be able to attend and be part of. Um, the question that I did put in the chat in the chat is something that I had heard earlier um, in regards to appropriations and how to respond to the COVID took funds that we could use to help, but we can't now. So, and that's not, I don't know that that's something that I'll be responding to directly, but you know, that's just one of the questions that I had heard in addition to. Zach, I can, I can talk, but I didn't know if you want to. No, Drew, go for it. <laughs> All right. So um, one thing that we've been seeing across the country is that, I mean, like everyone is dealing with these budget shortfalls, right? Due to COVID and the lost tax revenue. Um, the, the best way to really fight back against the argument that we would have used this money had we had it, but we lost it, um, is really just to make a big stink. Um, contact the press, issue press releases, go online, um, do everything you can um, to, to let folks know about how awful the situation is and put the pressure back on the government to tell their constituents why they're not addressing the issues that matter to them. Um, I don't know if there is a resolution to this yet. There probably hasn't been. But I know going back to Hawaii, um, we heard that the uh, governor of the state had put some really horrible cuts to the HIV uh, budget. I think it was like close to 60 percent or maybe over um, in, in, in his budget. Um, and the the advocates in Hawaii and AIDS United as well um, just basically immediately went uh, back to them and said, this is unacceptable. Um, if this is not looked at soon, this is going to be like, we are going to be your nightmare. Um, people are going to know that you are standing between them and the health care they need and deserve. Um, and for most folks, that approach is kind of the way it has to be. I know we have our public policy council partners, um, Equitas Health in Ohio. They run a SSP in Columbus called Safe Point. Um, and I guess last year, two years ago, the city was going to completely um, get rid of funding for the program. And the CEO of Equitas, uh, I think, published an op-ed in the Columbus Dispatch, um, basically shaming 
the mayor and city council for for going back on on the program. Um, but a lot of times that's what it takes. Um, just making noise, being being loud and open advocates. Yeah. Um, and y'all, I, so I saw that I had like a number of requests for some of the studies that I referenced. So I'm just going to put links in the chat um, so that folks are able to access those. And it looks like Tammy, your hand is raised. Do you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, and this is my first time um, joining, um, participating in AIDS Watch. I am from Detroit, Michigan, and it was very informative. I really enjoyed and um, will absorb all of the information provided. My question I did put in the chat box um, was in regards to tomorrow's um, with the Senator. Should we, once we review the bills, we just focus on one um, topic that we want to um, discuss with them or two of our top that we want to focus on with them. Thanks for that, Tammy. Um, so luckily I'm going to be at the meeting with you with Representative uh, Tlaib tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we can talk more about this after uh, that specific meeting after the uh, chat um, is over. But I think the main thing is that you're going to have about 30 minutes. Um, and depending on the size of your meeting, mm -hmm. um, you're going to have around five people speak. Okay. Um, it could be less if there's only two or three of you. Um, but each person could really cover a topic. Okay. Um, there's nothing that says that you have to stick to one thing the entire meeting. Mm -hmm. um, as long as you can make your asks personal and relevant to the member of Congress, um, you're going to do well. So if you want to if you want to cover the For the People Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, um, but you also want to cover harm reduction, mm -hmm. there's nothing that says you can't do both. Um, and, and honestly, uh, it probably is more helpful if you cover a number of different topics um, so that you have different reasons to re-engage with the office. Um, and, and some folks, like if you go to, let's say you're meeting with Senator Peters, um, and you bring up Papua harm reduction and, um, the ACA, he may be lukewarm on the ACA, may not really care about harm reduction much, but he may be really interested in housing. So if you mention housing, that can be the hook for, you know, getting a good relationship started with that office, um, and pushing for meaningful change. So I, I would not shy away from sharing two or three or four. Uh, different topic areas during a meeting. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I would like to talk about that more after because I know we were supposed to meet with our groups yesterday, but only two out of the eight, I believe, or jo joined us. I will send you an email after this over. Thanks, Tammy. I don't see any um, like the little virtual hand hand raises. Do other folks have uh, any questions? And, and questions can be related to what Drew and I covered in our presentation. It can be related to your meetings tomorrow um, and any uh, any advice or, or anything you're looking for in terms of the advocacy piece, um, anything at all. Russell? I'll always raise my hand <laughs> I ask a question or something. <laughs> Um, I appreciate, you know, taking the time out. Um, I just want to let Drew know that the link that you sent me for tonkohouse.gov came to me privately. I didn't know if that was intentionally for everybody else. Um, and so I'm in the state of Missouri. What is the best way for me to, I know who some of my representatives are, but I am not po politically um, connected by, by way of like, I don't watch the news. Um, I, I let that stress away from me. Um, but what is the best way that I can research? Um, say we'll just pull out Josh Hawley. Um, what is the best way for me to find out if he is supportive of, um, 
access to health care appropriation or civil rights or the um, SSPs. Did you want to weigh in or? No, go for it. Okay. Um, so I just want to start off by saying if you're not political, that's totally cool. Um, you don't need to be political or know a lot about politics to get involved with the people that represent you um, and, and to make change for people who use drugs, for SSPs. Uh, you don't necessarily need to know how the sausage is made. You just need to tell them what needs to go in the sausage. Um, so with Missouri, um, y'all are an interesting case um, in that you're, you're getting progressively redder right now. Um, it's becoming more GOP heavy um, and your, your senators are not great um, on HIV related issues. Um, and the one that's better, um, Senator Blunt is leaving. Um, so I, I guess sort of like my, my response would be um, connect with folks that are politically active um, and can you know carry that load for you. Um, a lot of the times, like I'm happy to, my, my email is dgibson at agentunited.org. Anyone on the call wants to talk shop, it's open. Happy to, to, to talk with you about state or local issues, federal issues, whatever. Um, this is what I like doing, I'm sick that way. Um, so I would just be on Twitter otherwise, you know, yelling at Josh Hollick directly uh, rather than talking with you about him. So um, by all means, feel free to reach out. But um, the other thing I'll mention is that while Holly's not a great example, um, SSPs are a bipartisan issue. Um, the Trump administration supported SSPs. Um, Richard Shelby, the, uh, the Senate Appropriations Chair, has been a traditionally a, a fairly decent supporter of SSPs, as have a number of other Republican senators. So never assume that based on the letter after their name that they're not going to care about your issue, particularly if you're in a state like Missouri, where most people have the R after the name and not the D. Um, you'd be surprised how well meetings can go, um, whether it's they have someone in in there, um, as, as Jesse just mentioned in the chat, um, Missouri just passed moving uh, to expand Medicaid. Um, tons of states across the South are, are sort of coming to the same crossroads. Um, and you'd be really surprised sort of how many good meetings you can have with Republican staffers and Republican members. Does it mean they're always going to, you know, vote the way we want them to? Probably not. Um, but the conversations are worth having. Um, so I, I would always you know, take a meeting with anybody. Yeah. And maybe Marjorie Taylor Greene. I don't know about that. But and anyone else, take the meeting. And along those lines, Drew, I mean, um, something that I found really illuminating the first time I did any sort of um, visits to the Hill, um, which was at AIDS Watch a few years ago, um, is that I'm from Kentucky. And so I was going around with, with advocates from Kentucky and um, I was like blown away by how well received what we were talking about was in, in places like Mitch McConnell's office, because growing up in like, a democratic family in Kentucky, you know, my family always railed again, still does against Mitch McConnell. But, you know, these people, if you're from their state, they work for you. Um, and so your voice and your opinion matters to them because that's a vote. And so um, make sure that, you know, they, you'll, I think you'll be surprised. They really do listen. Um, and, and they, they treat you well when you're, um, when you're one of their constituents and um, yeah. I know, so we've got like 11 minutes left um, and we've got three hands raised. I think the first one I saw pop up was Rita. So I'm gonna go to Rita next. So um, Drew, you were saying that for the gentleman that you were prior um, referencing to that Blunt had left. And um, so you have a lot of new people that's in the Senate or the Congress that, that we'll be speaking to tomorrow. So how do you go about building a relationship from them with them in order to um, get them to understand, to learn, to um, get on board maybe with what we're looking for, we're asking for? Or do you just say, well, these are all new people. We're not going to try to attempt to do anything with them. Just let it be. 
That's a great question, Rita. Um, so I guess a couple things. One, um, just for clarification, Senator Blunt is not leaving until uh, this Congress is over. So um, you'll super meet with him and his, his staff um, tomorrow. But in terms of new members, new members of Congress don't always have new staffers, right? People get recycled a lot on, on Capitol Hill. So if you're meeting with a health um, legislative assistant for a new member of Congress, odds are they probably worked for a different member last year. Um, so uh, honestly, every single relationship you make on the Hill has the potential to be really good and transformative. Um, just as everyone has a potential to be very blah and forgettable. Um, the biggest thing I would say is going in with an open mind, um, with a solid idea of who you are, who, what your asks are and who, who the pro program you're with or people you represent, um, are, are, are asking for. Um, and if possible, inviting them to come by your program or your clinic or your group when they're back in their district. There's nothing members of Congress like more than being able to show off that they visited, you know, a health center here or an SSP there. Um, and it's a great way to get to know them and your, your, your district. You got all your things in the car. What the hell is that doing? Looks like I think after that we had Kiva more than Nikos. Um, oh yeah, Drew, thank you. I just wanted to really just piggyback off of, of what you were saying. Um, um and then to just help um uh what is where is he? Russell. There he is. <laughs> um, you know, Soapbox is a really, really helpful tool. Um, you know, it's really, really impossible to, um, to remember all of the things that our, um, our representatives that we're going to meet, um, what their stance is on every little issue when it comes to um, health uh, determinants and, and social determinants and all of these different things. It's really hard for us to remember these things, especially when we're not political people. But Soapbox really gives you um, a lot of tools to help kind of like give you a background of what those representatives are really about in office in DC. Um, it shows you their voting history. It shows you the committees that they're on. Um, and so I've always made it a habit to kind of like get that idea to where I know where the, where the frame of mind of where this person is. Um, luckily, Hawaii is a smaller state. And so um, a lot of our representatives are familiar with the work that we do um, and the different agencies within the um, age services organizations across our state. Um, and so um, one thing that sticks out to me that that uh, representative Ed Case told me the very first time that I actually met him and I and I and I tend to remember this whenever I'm actually going to see a senator or a representative um, is that they really hear about the issues all the time um, in conversations with their colleagues in conversations with their staff and then in colleagues in conversations with their constituents. They really, really hear about different issues all the time. And what really sticks out to them is our personal stories what our connection is to the, to the issues, why we're really there, um, what got us into the work and how come we're doing what we're doing and how come we're saying it the way that we say it. Um, that tends to stand alone with them a lot more. And I've actually heard our representatives, you know, use stories on the floor um, to justify the way that they vote and to justify the way that they, the, the position that they take on certain issues. So um, I encourage you just to really kind of know what their voting history is, but also when you have an opportunity to meet with your actual senator representative and not just their staff, talk about your own story because it's really going to go a long way in helping them to actually remember um, the, the conversation. Um, Ed Case has come to uh, Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center a number of times since the first time that I met him. Um, and our new representative, Kai Kaihele, is another person who is really close to aid services here in Hawaii. 
Um, and it's because of the personal stories that he has connected to HIV in Hawaii. So it just goes a long way when they're able to remember our faces and remember who we are, especially if this is gonna be an annual thing that we get to visit with them. So just wanted to share that with you. Yeah, absolutely. Very well said. Thank you for sharing that. Um, all right, uh, Morgan. Uh, this is maybe kind of uh, the wrong space for this. I don't know. But um, one of the things I've been talking with um, just people locally about is um, the need for syringe service, especially during COVID, um, for people who don't use drugs, but are not illicit ones. Um, so people with diabetes, people who are on HRT, uh, they at least in some places have passed um, rules where they have to sign up for um, like syringe disposal that is delivery and pickup based. And that's a, that's a cost to them. Um, so if we had access to disposal um, safely or safe to pick up syringes for those folks, I think that, um, you know, especially in rural areas, it would uh, <clears throat> decrease the syringe litter some. And I was, I was wondering if you had any success with kind of taking that angle as well as the, it, well, just to combat that it's all about drug users. Um, I mean, yeah, I think that there are, um, you know, there certainly been times when advocacy um, efforts to kind of broaden um, the the scope and to say, you know, that this these are services that, that don't just serve people who use drugs. Um, I think one of the things that, that advocates do a lot, especially around harm reduction, is to talk about the benefits to the entire community. Um, I think that kind of framing it in that way that these are, are community-based organizations that are serving a specific community, but that have impacts much broader than that um, is a good way to kind of build into that advocacy to get folks to understand that, um, you know, that these are legitimate healthcare services that, um, that do good for the folks that access them, but also do good for the folks that don't. Um, and so I think in kind of in that similar framing, you could certainly talk about different types of people that might be able to access the services that they provide. I mean, if a syringe services program is providing HIV or viral hepatitis testing, like you don't have to be a, someone who uses drugs to go and get a test there and, um, and to be connected to services through them. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times we talk about the uh, the distribution of supplies as really the tool of engagement, but there's certainly other ways that syringe services programs engage folks. Um, and there's certainly other types of people that might access services there. Um, so yeah, I think that's absolutely something you could, you could bring up. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah, you know, when we're doing on, on when we're doing advocacy, when it comes to syringe services, I think Nico said it when he first um, spoke during this presentation, one of the first things that we talk about is the fact that we took 1.2 million needles off of the streets. Um, oh. in, in the year 2020, um, keeping them out of the, the parks, the beaches and the schoolyards across the state. Like that's something that we use as a key tag regularly because we know that that's where the carrot is and that's what their interest is. They don't care that our, our intravenous, you know, our substance users are getting clean needles. They really care like, how is it protecting my kids, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I think like, it's so common that um, that lawmakers are so concerned about needle sticks. Um, like you would think that this was just some sort of like epidemic, um, you know, it's like, okay, like, could you maybe get uh, worked up about the 81,000 people that died last year? Like, that's a crisis. Um, but, but yes, like going in there and talking about like, you know, not focusing on the distribution piece, but focusing on the collection piece and saying, you know, that we're, we're collecting them, we're creating a safe disposal, we are going out and doing community cleanup events. Um, those things really have an impact with lawmakers, absolutely. Um, and in our last couple of minutes, I wanna go to Nikos for, for a question. I, I just had an inquiry about uh, bringing up the, the issue of uh, revising the federal crack house statute that our president helped put into law 
to facilitate access uh, for uh, safer injection sites and uh, overdose consumption facilities. I know this is far down the road, but we I think it, we should really be looking at, you know, how we can better, you know, serve people who inject drugs and giving them a place for, for respite and, you know, to escape the heat here in Hawaii or to escape the cold and to have, you know, minimal supervision in case something goes wrong is, is I think, uh, has a beneficial impact on the surrounding community, certainly. We've seen it in in uh, British Columbia, for example, in terms of getting some of the injection activity off the streets. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I, and you know, I, I don't think it's down the road at all. I mean, it's here, right? Like we're, I mean, the, the case is playing out um, with Philadelphia and with the, the site that they're trying to implement. And, um, and we've seen some victories and we've seen some setbacks. And um, I think it's like absolutely critical and reasonable to go into some of these meetings and, and say like, you know, this is something that we, this is an intervention we also need to incorporate. It's not the only thing that's going to work, but it will certainly help save some lives and it will certainly connect some folks to the care that they need. Um, and so I think it's a, it's a great thing to bring up. And I don't know, Drew, if you have other thoughts on it. Um, no, I mean, I, I would just say that um, Age United was the first um, national HIV organization to come out and support uh, Save Your Trump to Spacious. Uh, we wrote, were on amicus brief for Safe House during the case. Uh, we, we want to do everything we can to help SES become a part of the American harm reduction arsenal. Um, and I, I think part of that right now is doing the quiet behind the scenes work with DOJ officials in the Biden administration um, and finding ways to promote this, whether it's talking about them as overdose prevention centers or as overdose prevention sites, um, reframing it, um, whatever we can do to make it more palatable to um, more middle of the road Democrats like uh, President Biden um, without altering the services we provide, um, I think is, is something that we're going to be looking into. I know Drug Policy Alliance is doing great work on this. Um, and if you have any questions, we'd be you know, happy to work with you um, or anyone else on the call who's interested um, on promoting safe accepted sites. I know Zach in his capacity uh, as sort of the, the head of the syringe access fund is giving out money um, to um, SCS sites. Um, so yeah, I, we are 100% in support of it and uh, would, would love to talk more. Yeah, and we have, um, I mean, we have a great um, resource on our website uh, about bringing safer consumption spaces to the U.S. that I, I helped create. Um, and Drew's right, we have, we've supported efforts in, in Philadelphia. We've supported the Safe House effort. We've also supported efforts um, in New York City. Um, so, yeah, we are uh, very much behind safer consumption, overdose prevention, whatever name you want to put on it, like, we support it. Um, so, um so we're we're at we're a couple minutes over time. This has been a really fantastic discussion. Thank you all so much uh, for joining us uh, today. I um, put my email in the chat. It's uh, just you know it's Z Ford, my last name at ageunited.org. So um, if anyone has follow up questions or wants to get in touch or, or learn more about the work Age United is doing through the Syringe Access Fund, please please reach out. I would love to chat with you. Um, but good luck tomorrow. I mean, I think everyone that's going to meetings tomorrow, y'all are going to be great. Um, enjoy it. It's a really, it's a really fun experience. Um, and I wish you well tomorrow.